Alors, euh, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, euh, la session aujourd'hui euh, est en anglais, euh, mais euh, posez vos, euh, vos questions euh, et vos commentaires en, en français. Je, je, je crois que Jeff euh, comprend bien euh, le, le français, alors euh, on va faire euh, comme ça. Um, let me start by uh, welcoming Jeff. Horn player Jeff Nelson needs little introduction, uh, I don't think, uh, to this group of students. He is, of course, uh, best known uh, as a member of the beloved uh, Canadian brass. He has played concertos and chamber music on six continents and is known as a formidable pedagogue. And that's really why we've uh, asked Jeff to join us here today at uh, Orchestre de la Francophonie 2020. So thank you, Jeff, and uh, welcome. Thank you, merci beaucoup. <laughs> Mon plaisir. Uh, je habite au Montréal pour six ans, mais je oublié tout ça mon français. Je suis désolé. <laughs> je sais, mais uh, j'habite uh, au Alberta. Um, so c'est mon, ex mon, mon excuse pour mon français pas bien. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for having me. Merci beaucoup. Uh, it's, I hope you're all taking this time uh, to, as quickly as possible, mourn your losses and uh, see what we were going to have in our lives that are not happening now, did not happen. Any of the undergrads whose graduations might have been seriously affected by the craziness of April or uh, yeah, seeing if any there were any high school kids who had their graduations. Anyway, all these different things of what the current state of the world is teaching us about the change from being entitled to what we thought was coming. And now we have, to, we are being nicely reminded of being appreciative and thankful for what we'd still get to do, you know, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about today is fearless performance. And it's all about noticing when we're choosing fearful thoughts or negative thoughts and being okay with that and then replacing it with better thoughts and better reasons why we're doing anything. Uh, I'm going to, I sent some uh, PDFs at some point, some handouts that I will talk about. And, uh, but, I, and I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know, Maritza, if there's a structure for when we'll do a question and answer. It can be anytime in the chat or anything along the way. I love to, be guided by you guys and what you want to talk about because the fearless performance thing is a four-day seminar so i can talk forever <laughs> okay so we'll just watch we'll watch for a quick q a and um also the um the handout that you sent me yesterday has been distributed to the students uh, uh in our intranet so uh, they've had a chance to uh, uh, hopefully look at those okay yay great um so we begin, hello Pace. Pace Sturdivant is one of my major, major influences and inspirations for life and for Indian food and sushi and um, music. And uh, he just helped me really nourish my love for music and sharing and uh, yeah, kind of transcending the brass player aspects of the technician uh and which we all have as aspects of musicians that that technician part but and doing that work being bored with not being bored with that work but bored with how difficult it might be at times and being bored with that and going into making music and doing it for better reasons remembering why we're doing it so thank you pace i saw you almost came on screen and then you disappeared he's slippery it's hard to, to tie that guy down sometimes you know um but yeah please pace if you have things to talk about. So, fearless performance is not necessarily the lack of fear, but rather the choice that there are things more important than fear. So I'm really sorry. Uh, it's not about becoming fearless forever. It's figuring out how to be fearless in a moment where we need to shift into a fearless place, also known as we've made many fearful choices and then discovering I'm fearful playing less well than I know I can 
um, and replacing those fears with better reasons why I'm on stage or practicing or talking to a friend or any of these things. I ask you all now, has anyone ever experienced practicing something and getting it to a certain level and then walk out on stage to perform it and share it and have it go not quite as well? Anybody, maybe one or two or 8,000 people, everybody all around the world, their hands shoot up. Everybody says, I can't see everybody either. I can uh, only, only see um, Maurizio. Uh, wonderful picture. Um, so I'm assuming that you all put your hands up. And uh, that's a yes, exactly, Ricardo. Um, yeah, all the time, exactly. Yeah, and me too, I think. And um, basically, we've played less well than we can. And this, this thing is being measured per note, per phrase, per movement, per concert, per week. It's whatever we decide. Um, but we've basically experienced what I call the quality gap. And it is the difference between what we can do, and even this is some uh, what we think we can do, and what we actually do live, in person, per note, per phrase, all of that. So any of this is, the qual is a quality gap, right? And that's what our goal is when we walk out on stage to perform or walk out into an audition or again if we're on a date any of these performance aspects uh, we want to be the best version of ourselves for as long as possible and then realize when we're having a noticeable quality gap and get back to being as well as good as we can over and over and over um, yeah often yeah it's yeah it's daughter in in dating me too i was single till i was 35 because i got so nervous and worried about what people thought about me and was so into trying to make the other person like me whether i was playing horn or on a date uh that i i wasn't present in the execution of the music or the moment that this person and that person was sharing so it's identical performance is everywhere as an athlete musician i do magic as a hobby as well uh, all these different ways so i'm going to break down the structure i'm going to talk about some of the problems i've had along the way that have ended up being my lessons uh, and then what you guys can do to work on it and shrink your quality gap and get good at performing at least at your best the other one about making your best better that's probably what your teachers are for and what listening to music and uh, study, score study and practicing and all that is for, do that too. Um, so I'm mainly talking about having a small quality gap between what you can do and what you actually do. Um, but also, if you practice as well as you can, that, I love that mental game of that will make your best better as well and then help you consistently be as close as possible to your best. Okay, so we'll break down. I've labeled some things. I think that's one way of helping. I have a lot of just three things as well. And one is the three places that you, Jeff, do, I, Jeff, do you need to get into teaching right away? Maybe not. I'll tell, um, I mean, for me, real, really quick about me, even just my story, uh, I played horn from when I was 12 to 15 or 16, and then I quit horn because people were telling me, you don't want to be a musician, it's too hard, there's no jobs. And uh, my teacher brought me in to have the talk to inspire me, and she said, you know, you're not in lessons, and you, you know, I don't think you want it enough, you should be doing more work or not doing it. And it, I think it went, I went not the way they, she had hoped, and I went, okay, I'll quit. <laughs> I stopped and went and tried to play basketball in high school and did other things. Quick fearless performance story about the basketball, because I kept learning about performance, whether it was on horn or basketball. I was great at showing shooting free throws. Uh, sorry, I'll try and speak slower. My I'm sorry again, mon français. Uh, I was I drew the foul. I got the foul in the basketball game, and I went to the free throw line, and I could sink free throws all day on the farm. I grew up on a farm near Edmonton. Uh, but then my first public free throw, I remember Laura Kalinowski was watching and I wanted to impress her. <laughs> and I made my shot and it barely made it halfway to the hoop. It just kind of went, <gasps> all my energy and concerns about being awesome and cool or impressive just sucked all the energy out of my arm. 
and it, and it was just I'll never forget that and and uh, how that was my you know the I think the beginning of learning about fearless performance and being consistently as good as I could be in any moment and how to do that and this is your your job your test as well or your opportunity to you and to use music as a way to get to know yourself and how to make something good figure out how good could be more good more hireable it's art right so the good bad is less interesting than hireable enjoyable by certain people and other people will hate it you can't make everybody happy but if you want to be a musician or get as good a job as possible for yourself and as good a life partner if you're going to get married or partner up with someone else all of that has to do with you bringing the best of you often enough to share that in the world and attract that to you uh, i like using that critique of um unemotional things like hireable in tune pure all those things instead of just good and bad but my point to all this is that you are learning about yourself and how you choose fear and how to replace that fear so in the in the process of learning i've labeled three things um and i the the pdf that you guys have is called training in thirds so there's three thirds uh, and the first third is build and that's practice prepare do all you can to learn the techniques and so let's say you have a performance this is the system through which you can train for these um, and then i can talk more about either emotional choices or how to practice learning about fear and replacing it so the build phase is your first if you have three months let's say you got told today that in three months you have to release a video of you performing something or make a pdf about something that you want to teach or you have a orchestral audition or uh, some sort of performance in three months so you divide the time up into thirds so each third is a month long first third is your build phase and this is the phase through which you prepare so you learn the score you learn the music you practice your scales and you find out you add stories to your music add little dramas like this is the moment darth vader comes in and attacks the muppet or whatever you need whatever you're into it all works because it's internal and it's what makes your music uniquely yours your inner movie or opera or drama instead of just getting the ink right i was always and pace helped me so much with that what's your story what's your tension and release and what what why why is that note on beat one why isn't that note on beat one figuring all this out as well as you can and have being having lessons and all these other things but you're in the priority is built and then at the end of your first third this is what puts some urgency on it that's when you start sharing sharing is the best word i can come up with for performance you share it includes the audience you're not to worry about what they think about you but you're sharing to them and giving them your story so that first third is your build uh at the end of your first third or day one of your second third you have already scheduled and you are now about to play for somebody your piece or excerpts from your list or whatever that you've done all the work so knowing that you have to perform at the beginning of your second third puts urgency on that first third now i really have to get it done way sooner than the day before the concert or the day of the concert that was a bonus actually my one of my students came in freaking out about getting held in leben you know and he was like i just can't get it and i was like oh it's okay you're not playing it for another two months and he's like my first third ends tomorrow and i was like oh and then he played it and it was amazing it was the he had like quadrupled his horn playing he he got very very good very quickly and i think it's because of that urgency getting all and all your intonation tendencies and look at the tuner and see i need this note lower all that end of your first third second third is your share phase and so now you're performing daily and these days we've been given a gift of online performance for each other um I've been working for 15 years on a website where people can perform for each other and have a community of, of performing for each other and getting to experience what we put ourselves through when we stand backstage, get ready to perform and walk out on stage and make choices, and all that. So now online, you can play for people every day. And that's what your second third is. Share, 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 record yourself, um, whatever, set up your, I'll talk about how to set up what I call magic line performances. Uh, through and it's 
bunch of guidelines through which you can learn the most about yourself when you perform. And I'll show you one and do one and all of that. That's what you're doing in the second third and you're collecting people, you know, okay, what did you think? You perform and then, um, okay, what did you think? And you let all their comments come to you and go, uh -huh, even if you disagree and you, <laughs> even if you want to crawl into a little cave. I remember uh, Dale Clevenger uh, teaches with me at IU now. He was principal horn in the Chicago Symphony for 48 years. And my first lesson with him, I <laughs> I've listened to it since. And he's like, that's out of tune. That can be way softer. Um, remember I played the beginning of Schubert 9. And it went pretty well. I've been playing in woodwind quintets. And I'd already played in the Montreal Symphony and Vancouver. And, and he goes, can that be softer? And I went, sure. And I got way softer. And he's like, I can be way softer. And I remember thinking, yeah, right. And he picked up his horn and went, like just blew my mind. So that changed my world forever. But it, listening to the recording also, he was very, very clear with me. I wouldn't say hard on me. He was just clear. I, and I had emotional choices to make during those lessons of either it's, oh, look, you know, that's out of tune. That's, that could be way more in tune. What note are you on? What part of the chord are you? I was like, I don't know. Uh, I think that's out of tune. And but listening to the recording, I just kept saying, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. You know, and every time you get that, you can either go, really? Oh, you know, and get emotional. Then your teacher has to slow down for you as well. Make sure you're okay. <laughs> or just, okay, thank you. It's your opinion. Uh, if someone else tells you that you're out of tune and you know that they play out of tune all the time, then the same thing works. Okay, thank you. I'll let that one go by. You know, you're always choosing. Uh, I love the saying, it's not information overload. It's filter failure. So all the different, you know, how do I take all this critique and what do I do with it all? You choose and you filter and you keep what serves your definitions of success that you've already chosen at your age already. You're, you're thinking what, what is best. Uh, I'm going to go off on tangents a lot, but I promise to come back to the main topics. But I'm reminded of another time I played my excerpts for a man, trumpet player named Charles Duvall. And he was playing principal trumpet in Montreal at the time when I was at McGill. And I played my loud, as loud as I could, my fast, as fast as I could, because you know, you're know you supposed to show off what you can do in an audition, show what you can do. So, and I finished and he said, you're really young, aren't you? I said, yeah. He says, well, you need the illusion of maturity. Oh, okay. So I went and pretended to be a mature horn player that played steady and, <laughs> and revered music over showing off and playing as loud as I could. So that maturity factor is that other thing that we're sculpting in this second, third. We get to play for as many people as we can to vet it or to test it, you know, and, and hopefully get over the t being tested factor that all we need to do is perform perform. It's not a, it's a mock audition. I don't know. Perform. <laughs> it's a, a run through. Very bad name for what we're doing. You're not running it through. You're performing. So, and you never have to play better. And, and that's how we get nervous, right? Is deciding this time matters more. Uh, and I think if we leave, we leave room, um, if we, we leave room for us to play it better, we just haven't made all the other performances matter enough. So if we make every note musical and magical with amazing intention and sound, then we never have to play it better. Phil Myers is the first horn of the New York, was the first horn of New York Philharmonic. He said casually at lunch one day, he said, yeah, I don't go out there to play my best anymore. I just go out there to play like me. Just that. Nice idiot proof, just execute. Me, my horn, my music, alone. La, 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 la. Oh, someone comes in the room. Hi. Me, my horn, my music, five more people come in. Hi. What, I'm online for a million people? Hi. Me, my horn, my music, that really way of being selectively stupid while obsessing about the opportunities in front of us, the music and going to those. Those have been my fear replacements. 
and also my <laughs> also my fear choices <laughs> revering it and not wanting to insult the music and all these different choices they've all driven me to be able to play with Canadian brass I played a year on Broadway that's what I was telling my story um, yeah I'm Canadian I have I'm a French horn player I think I miss every other note in my opinion very unhirable but a bunch of orchestras told me that they wanted to hire me so I said okay but I miss this and this and the, no I'll take the job but okay you know so it's not up to you to decide if you deserve the job it's up to you to listen to the excerpts and study the music and practice your instrument and put it all together on stage at as close as possible to your best version and then after that find out what people thought and what could be better and start again and over and over and over again. And so my performance circle is build, be, share, build, be, share, over and over again, build and prepare. And then at some point, the build stops and you're sharing. And between those two is this moment backstage that I call the be phase. And that's where you're just being who you are. You're not thinking about should I could, should have practiced more. Too bad, too late, you're about to walk out on stage. <laughs> that is a destructive choice to think about that at that moment. Build, be, share, which is different. I'm really sorry, but I'm still putting this together. I'm not still putting this together, but the, the paper, the online course and book that I'm put, creating will show the difference between build, be, share, the performance circle, and then it's build, share, be is the training in thirds. Thing. I will make those two things very clear. So the performance circle, build, be, share, build, be, share, practice. And then backstage, you be, you just be who you are um, and embrace what you got. And you can make it better after the performance. And it'll always be better. You can make it better, but get over that. Once you're backstage, that's the time for you to just embrace who you are and what you have to share and any of the opportunities out there that lie on the other side of that magic line that you're about to cross on stage. I have an inspirational sheet that I use. It says things on it like, they want you to play well. Tell them your story. Every excerpt is the only excerpt. I'll talk about that when I talk about Magic Line performances. The build, be backstage, then cross the line, and now it's all about execution. Uh, and it's smiling and bowing and all that. I'm not playing yet, I'm walking. This is the easy part, walking and smiling and bowing. And, and, and that, and that's it. And then I'll, I'll get to the horn playing part. And then I read the inspirational sheet again, if I can, if I have a stand. Um, all this process, this whole fearless performance thing and other people's systems for performance, one of the most powerful things about it is that it helps you build your own performance system habits. So you don't have to remember it all the time. You don't have to think about it. And worst off, you don't have to experience forgetting. You do it enough times. Because putting your instrument together, I remember my sister plays bassoon, she didn't even know how to put it together <laughs> at first and now she doesn't she doesn't have to think about it she can same with performance i stand here then i stand backstage and then how often have we been standing backstage waiting calling that waiting is a decision and you're not waiting you're backstage you're standing there while this audience is sitting there and you're you're gonna stand there and prepare still be you and be in that midst of potential one of the thinking process definitions that I really like, I saw on Facebook. It's, you know, well, that sounds simple, Jeff, just be calm backstage. It is simple, might not be easy, <laughs> but it's a simple concept. And if I keep it simple, it might be easier. It's when we complicate things that I think we get into trouble and get emotional. So this thing on Facebook that I saw, it said, if you are anxious, you are living in the future. If you are depressed, you are living in the past. And if you are at peace, you are living in the present. I love that. Anxious. If you're anxious and nervous, you're, you're living in the future. Your mind is on the future. Because you want to control something that you cannot control, the future. So you're, anxious, you're reaching for something you can never grab and never control. I want to influence it and I want it to then create the results I want. We are at least the best version of us when I'm executing on this note and this note and this note, not this note and how am I doing and all these other, and what about the note I just played? 
crazy complicated stuff. So anxious in the future, depressed if we're living in the past, because we want, if we're trying to change the past, we cannot change the past. So that's definitely something to be depressed about, not being able to change something. And it's depression is that sadness of wanting to control, change something that we can't. It's immediate answer, an immediate no answer, repetitive, depending on how much we're living in the past. <laughs> we can have the past help our future, but I'm working on the future right now. And I have definitions of success of the future, but my past is just who I, who I was. Uh, I get to work on it right now, whether I'm practicing or performing or standing backstage, that presence, it's a great way of having presence defined. And then performance is executing on everything I've done in my life up until that moment. It's as simple as that or it's super complicated and we're in a super fiery storm every time we walk out there. And I have been at times with different realities of swollen lips or uh, funerals or all these different ways of either freaking us out and having us play badly and not being hireable and not revering the music and not revering your audience, our audience. Or I did a concert, I was doing a recording with Canadian Brass the weekend that my dad died and it was, super emotional but i and i broke down and they sent me home on the when i found out but the next day i came back and recorded finished the recording canadian brass dedicated it to my dad it's the echo album all the gabrielli beautiful and beautiful emotional sharing and i can listen to that recording and know he's a big part of that and then two days later i had to go to the international horn society and perform for 700 hornists and i was playing one piece written by Malcolm Forsyth, a Canadian composer and friend of the family. He taught both my sisters and I at the University of Alberta. Uh, and I played a piece that he wrote for his daughter, um, Amanda Forsyth, a uh, cellist. And I, I, he arranged it for me for French horn. Crazy idea, but an awesome piece. But I, and it's called Pop's Cycle, the Eclectic Suite. And I was dedicating it to my dad. And I looked out into the audience and two of my students were near the front row and they were both tears were just streaming down their faces and they saw me see them and they were like, oh, and they tried to smile <laughs> with these tears. And I just kind of looked away and kept going forward to serving my dad and then the music and then this audience and to give and went into it a lot more. But it's all that thought just comes to mind about um, it can always be worse and we get to do what we can do and now what? So when I finished the Fearless Performance book, my second book will be called, You're Right, Now What? And it's about going into those opportunities, like Pace, looks like Pace is going to come on the screen. Is that possible? Pace was at my wedding. Um, he... Quick hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, just very quick. Bravo, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks to you. Oh, no, no, you did the work. Yeah, but you yelled at me. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go for it. What do you think? What do I think? What do you, not to be, and this is not to be self-serving, but it could it'd be great. What did you see me doing that could help our listeners? Like what were the choices that you saw me do? Because you know I had lots of troubles along the way. I'm going to tell a quick story about Pace and then place if you want to share some stuff that could help everybody uh, at our wedding this is something I'm another favorite saying that is find focus in the chaos right I think we make a mistake of deciding oh no that's chaotic and that's bad no, mm, could be but chaos is always coming somehow <laughs> so the chaos itself when we embrace it okay things are going to go wrong but don't know what it is yet so I just need to find focus in the chaos what I what can I focus on I mean, I, I've heard that two, a, a robber and then two policemen ran up and over a Canadian brass concert that my sister was at, and they just kept playing. Um, so at the wedding, my, my now wife uh, wanted a thousand candles on the hill. And, uh, and, you know, we're planning a wedding, so there's thousands of little pieces to worry about, and I was just saying, yes, yes, great idea. Yes, let's do that. I was very good. <laughs> um, but all the candles blew out. And everyone freaked out. And I remember going, oh, 
ah, there's the big thing that's going to go wrong today. <laughs> and then Pace in his beautiful suit was bent over with all the bridesmaids and everybody was lighting, relighting the candles and a bunch of people were freaking out and yelling and Pace just gave me a wink and he was just loving it. He was just smiling going, this is exciting, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, and then they all blew out again. They all blew out twice. Everybody freaked out. But and when, when the wedding happened, all the candles were there, and we got our nice picture. And thanks for coming to the wedding. What what kind of things would help people manage their fearful choices, or especially at this unique time of the future of music? I just did my interview online, so I'm I'm in interview mode as well. Okay. Um... When I first met you, I realized that you were a huge talent, but it came so easy to you that you took it to 70%. And that, that's as far as you would go. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, we've run out of time, Pace. We need to move on. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there was that moment when you made a decision which changed your life, and certainly your playing. And and you realize that 70% wasn't good enough anymore. And you, you s strove for a completely different ideal, which was the best that I can do, the best that I can be. And the change was uh, phenomenal. And you always had it. That's the point. It was always there. You come from an incredibly musical family and you're a fantastic musician, incredible instincts, knowledge. And, uh, but it was that commitment that change and then it was well okay what is the best how can i make it better when you did all that thank you and with you you're, you're very welcome <laughs> Whew. yeah it's just you're in every note i play my dear thank you <laughs> and every belief like the, the belief is in those notes as well like they can't come out without the belief of of sharing that you know yeah uh, and that's what we all want to tell all of you listening and growing up and got some practicing to go and the, the wildest thing for you guys but if you want to stay pace that would be awesome um sure um that i feel for my students and for all of you that there's this this line and dale clevenger says says you you don't have to do it this way but you have to be able to do it this way, you know, and being able to tell stories in different ways. And though that's true and it's awesome, and I love it when he says that, if it's heard in a good way. But some students I also see hear it in a way that I have to know everything. <laughs> I have to be totally bulletproof and perfect and all these horrible definitions of success that are just not accurate. I miss notes in every audition that I want. And I, I, I probably missed notes in all the auditions I lost too. <laughs> um, but it's that healthy approach to doing the best you can, see where it is, make and make it better, mark your part, and, and then go do two good routine sessions of 25 minutes, uh, each two 25 minute routine sessions, building the habits in your technician so that you can then make the music and then go execute it and share with your performer mind once you're in performance over and over and over again. Um, and the commitment to why I'm still scared out of my mind. I got really nervous for this class. Uh, I got nervous from my thing an hour ago. Uh, and I'm constantly in this state. I think, I guess I thrive on it in some ways, but I've also made enough of the things I'm doing and giving and sharing and hopefully helping with more important than what I'm afraid of and my fears and what I know I messed up last time and I might mess up again. That's living in the past and uh, creating all this anxiety of the future. Uh, I, I remember when I was at McGill, I'm in my third year, and I'm getting ready for the Winnipeg Symphony audition, and I'm playing for Pace and Dan Gress, and uh, really being really scared, but figuring it out, and they're pointing out these things. I remember playing one, uh, Shostakovich 5, low 2D. Beep, 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 beep this low thing and uh and dan just i think i was staying at his house so he also yelled from the kitchen going make those match make those colors match and i was like okay and i probably just played it louder <laughs> so they all matched <laughs> but and I'm, 
just the 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 real and you know you, every every one of you has heard that in a lesson right it match your colors or this note sticking out or you can hear it on your own recordings and then to be unemotional about it and go okay yeah i'll go work on that a bit today and get it to where i can and but that's all that matters is where we get it to i remember that clicking for me that i i know what it what great i also had a complicated thing in my head of would they hear that i know it's out of tune but would they have heard that you know that's too complicated get it as good as you can without the emotional that destructive limiter of it's not perfect Ugh, i'm gonna feel bad about it and this is what i feel for my students and you guys is that you can't know what's hireable until you've been hired <laughs> so it's just this mass of everything so uh, that's where I recommend 25 minute sessions and do six, eight of them a day, whatever you can, whatever you can do and set your goals pretty clearly. Uh, I'm going somewhere else with the story as well, which I'll finish that when I went to Winnipeg, I walked in and I hadn't been hireable yet. Um, and I went and played and then they ended up giving me the job. And so now I'm a professional. So now I can think of myself as a professional and the next notes I play are by a professional. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, ask yourselves, would I have won the audition if I didn't walk in there and play like a professional without permission, without any, no one had told me I was a professional. So I had to walk in there and definitely pretend <laughs> pretend have the illusion of maturity or that's the unpermissioned self-belief until you've been hired you don't know what that line is and i was shocked when i got the job i was like but i missed this and this and this it was just so gloriously imperfect in my mind because i was so small myopic very detailed in my thinking but it told enough stories to get me hired. The next year was Montreal Symphony. I remember in Winnipeg, it was a one, both one year sabbatical replacements. Um, Pace and Dan actually hired me to play the summer of 93 on Forthorn with the National Arts Center, also scared out of my mind. And they were like, you're doing fine, you're doing fine. Thank you, thank you, Pace. Um, Montreal came up, another one year Forthorn sabbatical replacement. And I remember seeing a movie called Rudy uh, in the theaters, and then I, and I knew about the Montreal Symphony audition. And the movie has the character; uh, he wants to play on the Notre Dame football team, and uh, he keeps trying, <sighs> not getting it, trying, not getting it. It's very tiring. And uh, but he asks his his advisor, you know, what else can I do? And his advisor, his father, keeps saying, "Are you doing everything you possibly can towards your goal?" And he just kept going, no, and go and do more work. It was so, and then in the end, you have to see the movie. If you haven't, I can't tell you. But French horns play beautiful music. And uh, so I, in Winnipeg, I saw the movie. I drove to the middle of a field, which is very easy to do in Winnipeg. And I sat there and I was like, okay, are you going to do everything you possibly can toward this? What are you thinking, Jeff? You, Montreal Symphony? You don't, you can't play in that. Or that's, you know, the Montreal, I studied at McGill, I was in my place for Montreal. Wait, that doesn't matter, Jeff. How much do you want it? How much do you want it? Do you want it enough to get over your fears and your ideas of what you deserve and let the world decide what you get? How much do you want it? So I went home and I had what's called a clock radio at the time, your phone basically now, and I set the alarm for six in the morning gonna get up at six and drink water all day and eat the best fruits from the land and take the stairs everywhere you know we've all had those moments uh the alarm went off unfortunately i woke up at nine and uh, doubled my efforts and i wrote on a post-it note how much do you want it and i put it on my alarm and uh, the alarm went off again and i went to hit snooze and i see in my own handwriting how much do you want it uh, I wanted enough to get out of bed and I get to the bathroom and I think I can go back to bed just for another. And I look on the mirror and it says, no, Jeff, how much do you want it? <laughs> go pick up your horn or whatever it is and stumbled my way through each day. And you can't, you uh, made up a saying that uh, success not only comes to those who want it the most, it comes to those who want it the most often. 
couple of some little post-it notes, inspirational things. I made my desktop on my laptop, the Montreal Symphony. And then I ended up, after the first round of the Montreal Symphony audition, uh, very scared, I went in and played and walked out very disappointed. Went to the bathroom to put some water on my face. And I looked and I was wearing a white shirt and black pants. And I you know, went and put water on my face and looked in the mirror and I looked down and my fly was wide open and then my white shirt was sticking out of the fly and it, I just broke into laughter <laughs> and just was like, oh man. Okay, Jeff, give yourself a break and take yourself so seriously. <laughs> I just came back to earth. I'll never forget that. I was like, come on, just let them send you home. Don't send yourself home. You know, and so I went in second round and played. And then I'll never forget, and you want this if you haven't felt it yet. It's just one of the greatest feelings ever. And it means so much. Was, anyway, I, they came out and they said, they said, number 36. And I slowly stood up around all these other horn players that I was sure were way better than me and, you know, already had jobs and, you know, and, and they were like, and I, I said, I remember saying, Anyone else? And I'm, my head's down. I'm just like, anyone else? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, okay. And I said, go on to the next round. And they're like, no, you win. And I was like, just, I'll never just chills again now for that experience. It was just amazing. And then I went, ha ha, losers. No, I didn't. <laughs> I've never made that joke before. That's a bad joke. Um, but I didn't. It was that another day, another excerpt. Anything could have changed the results. Maybe. I don't know for sure. And then I walked in, I remember the panel coming down and the second trombone player, Vivian Lee, Dave Martin's um, wife, uh, trombone player, she knew me because I studied at McGill and she looked up and went, I remember her seeing it, it's like, this guy, we have to tour with this child, I had a ponytail and I was very young. But it doesn't matter, it was a screened audition and it is how you tell your stories and how you perform and how you go in there. And I was scared out of my mind every note of the way, but I was diving more into the, those musical stories. So then I did that for a year and then I couldn't play, I couldn't start notes and I was gonna quit horn again. And then I did a Broadway show and started figuring out how to start notes and had lots of technical problems. My bottom lip, I fell asleep on a plane on the plane to Japan. My bottom lip turned into an old tire and I couldn't, I barely play at all. That was my first tour with Montreal Symphony. I remember just playing and smiling my way through the tears of just thinking I'll never work again. And I'm still thinking, every, you know, I'll never work again. And now I've played New York, Chicago, LA, Toronto, Montreal, Cleveland, Philly, Boston. I've played all over. It's just it's crazy. I'm a pig farmer, eight people in my town, and I've got to do this. And it's by doing what Pace taught me. <laughs> and what I'm talking about, what we're talking about, what he's talking to you guys about. Focus on that definition of success. I have endless stories as well. I tell one more quick story about Chicago. I'm going to tell one more quick story. So it's, um, this was, there was a, um, I made one other list up of, I was making a list of all the auditions I didn't win. And it was Hamilton Philharmonic, Canadian Opera Company, um, Canadian Brass. I was runner up for Canadian Brass actually before I joined uh, Chicago Symphony, Los Angeles Philharmonic, Philadelphia Orchestra. Anyway, all these things. And then I, I kind of looked at the list and I went, Oh, Indiana University as well. I was not the first choice for Indiana University. And I looked and I went, I've played with all those orchestras and all those, those groups, but I was, did not win right away. It's all this staying in there as well. I'm 50 now, so I'm old. So I've <laughs> been doing it for a while. But Chicago, for example, I, uh, everyone was telling, it was in 2000 and it was for two jobs, second horn and uh, um, a, a utility or assistant principal. And everyone was telling me, you don't want to do this audition. You don't want to do, they know who they want. They want someone from Chicago. They're just, you know, and, and I kept going, okay, are you finished? I'm, I have to go practice. You know, I'm going to just be that idiot and keep practicing. And I told you my, I went and had lessons with Dale, spent all the money I had. I was playing fourth horn in Vancouver at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, but I just learn, get there, get there, do what you can to make it sound good at your horn and let them decide. Um, so in the finals, out of I think a few hundred horn players at least, it was me and eight people from Chicago. 
in the finals, which kind of either says they were all right about me or I was the one non-Chicago idiot that really went for it. And my playing changed forever after just the process of going for it. That's something you'll always have, whether you win or not. The audition is your growth and your artistic learning and building of that. Excuse me. Uh, and then in the super finals, oh, anyway, before they were, I was getting ready for the super finals uh, and I was in the hotel on Michigan Avenue or whatever and um, I'm sitting there and I'm playing looking out the window and there's a guy walking on the street outside and I looked and he's in his three piece suit and he's, or whatever, his suit and he has a bag lunch and he's just walking and I'm like, man, like it's, it's just Tuesday for you. Like you're just going to your job for another day. And for me, today's gonna, it's going to decide everything for the rest of my life and how I live and all the, who I am and how my mother sees me and all this stuff. Um, actually, my mother never put that pressure on me. I did. And uh, it's just Tuesday for you, it's Tuesday. And then I, some voice in my head or I realized, it's actually Tuesday for you too, Jeff. <laughs> get over it stop it um and i wrote on my inspirational sheet it's just tuesday and i, I go to that so often it's just it is just another day and i've performed these excerpts thousands of times so it's performance number 1722 actually it's not walking in there today playing my first version and that's just length of memory and the way i train in that way um so i went in and uh, in the finals it was me and the two guys that got the job Odo and James and myself, we were the three finalists. Uh, and uh, yeah, came down to a bunch of things. I talked to Dale for an, uh, Dale Clevenger, the first horn, uh, for an hour after. They asked me to uh, go on a Carnegie Hall and South American tour, and then Canadian Brass called. And it had been two years with the guy who they gave the job to instead of me, and things were changing, and so they just offered me the job. Uh, and I got my stuff shipped from Vancouver. I was also supposed to take over the principal job in Vancouver with Bramwell Tovey. I had to call Bramwell and go, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, and he was the guy that hired me in Winnipeg in 93, all these different things. And I got to say no to Chicago Symphony for the first of probably a dozen times now. Um, and I got to play with them a lot as well. But you just, I'm a pig farmer from north of Edmonton, Alberta. And I just did what Pace talked about. How much do you want it? How much do you want it? It comes about that. And all the information is out there, all the goals of sound and everything. So now it's about self-knowledge and learning how you can get that out your instrument on your first performance. <sighs> oh. What do you think, Pace? Wow. Maurizio, yeah, what do you think? Hello. <laughs> well, should, uh, uh, the, the, there's a lot there and uh, <laughs> there's a lot to chew on and uh, the stories are great. Uh, of course. Shall, um, I'll go through the list. I'll, I'll, I'll open it up. Um, and uh, maybe you and Pace could chat for just a moment while I um, go sure. through the list and uh, enable um, our participants to join us. Sure. Okay, Jeff. Yeah. Um, one thing, I'm, I'm sure you've heard me say this before, and it plays exactly into what you're talking about, is that for every audition, there's one winner and 75 excuses. <laughs> and I try to get people to, no excuses. There are reasons, there are answers, there are things that happened, there are things that didn't happen. I think this plays exactly into what you're trying to teach everybody. And, uh, Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the idea, the short version of that for me too is what's it going to be, reasons or results? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And excuses are, is there, an excuse is probably more getting specific about defining the intention behind what we're talking about. Because there are reasons and there are, there's, there are explanations, but it becomes an excuse maybe when it's emotional and when it's justifying the negative emotion, then it's an excuse. So maybe that clarity that there are re reasons and uh, my goal is to be as unemotional as possible. So more scientific or content-based along those lines. Um, and, and I love words. My mother would always, my parents were opera singers, opera singing big farmers, like you do in Canada. Continue to book up. 
And, uh, but my mother would go get the dictionary and look up words and go, oh, I don't know. And just be so happy in not knowing. Go, Let's go look it up, you know. Uh, and my dad got his mechanical engineering degree, studied at University of Toronto, Toronto Conservatory of Music. That's where he met my mom singing. And he went and studied at Covent Garden and came back to the farm. And we farmed and had a thousand big and my mother didn't finish high school. So we had my dad with the university degree and my mother and both that mixture of, of I think going for learning and trying to get there. But the words I was going to explain was the difference between like the complicated. I remember once my student came in and, and I go, how you doing? And they're like, oh, busy, really busy. And I had just heard on a podcast that, uh, for business productivity, that the word busy shows mismanagement. <laughs> I love that. Versus I have a full schedule or I have a lot to do. That's a little bit, less, but busy. <laughs> then manage your time better and, and plot it out and schedule it. That was a great one for me. And then they, I said, well, what's going on? And they said, oh, it's complicated. And I said, okay, well, what if you only had two sentences? Ready, go. And they were like, well, okay this and 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 this oh that's a, okay yeah actually that's about it <laughs> you know so we complicate it and we get emotional about it so i re i replace complicated with complex even complex is is less emotional there's a lot of pieces so it's complex but i can do it i can handle this or figure it out or not and the, the solution is complex it has a lot of things but the amount of, of boards, uh, blackboards that Einstein had to go through to get to E equals MC squared, or Bach had to go through to be Bach, <laughs> that simplicity is a lot of work. We don't have to be emotional about it. And excuses, I think, are emotional about that. I was going around your question. Yeah, good point, Pace. You helped me a lot with that, with having excuses. I mean, uh, replacing the excuse. <laughs> That's the thing is you all know Pace, like he's never, we would at McGill, we'd be like, he would coach our quintet or we'd be doing lessons and everything. And weren't, didn't you, st weren't you here at seven in the morning? We heard, because we, you know, uh, yeah, it's okay. Shouldn't you go back to Ottawa? He's like, yeah, I was going to, but I'll, I'll go there early tomorrow. Let's, let's keep, here, let's play it again. You know, and it's just the love of music transcended exhaustion and maybe some good things too, but I can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just have to text my wife and tell her I'm fine. And we have other questions? Is there any questions of the participants for, for Jeff? We. Oui. You can uh, use the raise hand function or you can just ask Ask your question, you should pop up. Ah, Graham. Hi, um, can you hear or anything? Yes, Graham, go ahead. Okay, um, I just had a question uh, about um, kind of this, uh, the, the three tiers here. Um, Mostly about this uh, this second tier. Um, so I, I I've been I, I've heard a lot of um, I, I've read the the pamphlet and everything and uh, in the um, in the in the second tier I'm I'm kind of wondering it's like solely performance um, but how do uh, like how do we incorporate um, like improving from what we get back like the when, when we do all the filtering and we get oh well maybe i actually really could improve on this um do we go kind of back into kind of like a quasi building stage or should we just try and keep what we have from what we've already done cool yeah thanks graham i think i understand your question you can help me if i don't answer it fully the and i just brought up the pdf and it's only four pages for me. I can't see the PDF. I have to grab another one. But the, the tiers, the build, share, be tiers. Actually, and I didn't finish the explanation of all three um, tiers. 
I'll answer your question first. That the, those are priorities, basically, that you divide your time into those thirds. And then for each third, that's your priority is first building. You're practicing and you're making stories and you're, you can still perform, perform, little, perform for people if you would like. And then your second tier, it's about sharing and you share your ideas as much as you can while still practicing and taking those ideas home that day and doing your build. There's a build, be, share for each time you go to perform each day and you go and practice, stand backstage, experience your B phase, then share and come back to build again. That's why that's a circle. And you keep build, be, share each day. You might not share. Um, though I perform in the practice room as well for myself as well. So there's, there's a lot of performance. That's a, another massive topic is explaining the difference between practice and performance and finding that balance. We each have to do that. Uh, so each tier does have build in it. Yes, if, that's, if that answers your question. Is there more, um, more questionable things in, in, in those different tiers? And then I'll explain that third tier as well, the B. Come on, oh yeah. Graham, does that help or do you have other Yeah, questions? yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just also had a little bit of an, another question on another part of what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, uh, so kind of on this idea of like pretending or, or, or like, kind of convincing yourself to to be uh like more mature than you actually are or something like that uh does that involve like uh like really just trying to convince uh because i i do a lot of meditation sort of things nice. um uh, and uh a lot of the a lot of part of that is like visualization and uh, like of being the person that you want to be or being the horn player that you want to be. And, um, uh, and uh, is it sort of kind of in that direction of trying to like visualize what you want and to visualize you yourself getting there or like, is it another direction entirely from that? Yeah, awesome question and thoughts. And it's centered a lot in meditation uh, and I recommend everyone doing it if you're not already. There's information online and there's millions of ways of meditating, following your breath or whatever. And the goal is to follow something, you will inevitably get off of it. To, so you, the goal is to calmly notice, I mean, the goal is to focus on something, but also to notice when you're distracted or on something else and calmly notice and calmly come back to it over and over and over again. Um, so meditation is a big part of our practice and your self-image and the pretending factor and all of that is, it's, you can find it through meditation really well because meditation, in my opinion, and what I've heard and read and everything is about becoming efficient and present. And by definition, how I define it is also that you're losing anything extra. Those extra thoughts and the chaotic chasing of the mind and uh, and any, I think, self ego, uh, the ego and uh, what's the self-worth, the self-worth of what you believe you deserve, it's up to others. And so, so the meditation part is sitting in that and being okay. One of my favorite TED Talks is by Brené Brown. It's called The Power of Vulnerability. And the last slide, uh, just has a picture of someone and across their chest is written, I am enough. Uh, and this is all said in regards to lowering your quality gap between what you can do and what you actually okay. So, And it can maybe make what we can do a little better, but not a lot better. So we do have to practice. We do have to know <laughs> what Mozart wanted and how to play our instruments as well. It doesn't replace that, but it's a great companion of that. Um, and then it's through that that we can get to a place of either self-belief or not like a lack of self, right? And that you're serving the music. And it's either Wagner, Wagner or Nietzsche that said, uh, the greatest art appears when the ego disappears. And that's that getting into things greater than ourselves, 
such a big topic. Um, <laughs> thank you for asking about that there. I had one other thought about the meditation. Oh, also that, that's why I call it fearless performance and not confident performance. I think that uh, if you need to be confident, I think you've decided, we've decided that we need confidence. So I've made that arena that I'm entering into a place where I need to be confident. Boxers are confident, I think, and um, all that, but children are fearless. Like they just want the cookie. You know, where's the cookie? Yeah, 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 yeah hi, kid. You know, I, need, I want the cookie. Um, and so it's, I like the idea of fearless instead of confidence. I don't want to have to wield my confidence and, and have different awareness depending on who's watching and uh, all of that. It's execute, execute, perform, regardless of who's out there and what it's for, so that performance number 2028 might have the audition panel there or the big audience or the big competition or whatever, but I'm still just executing on the music. Another thought on that too is that I remember uh, after I left Canadian Brass the first time, uh, so I wanted to get married and live at home. Uh, and then the second time I left because we were pregnant and we were having a child. So now I'm back a third time, the kids are old enough. So all these choices of music and it, it was available to rejoin it, it's amazing. But the first time I was performing, I went to uh, do a solo and I, uh, I had been doing Canadian Brass for five years and this was at the International Horn Society thing as well. And um, backstage talking to people like I do with Canadian Brass. However, I had not realized that Canadian Brass, we've played similar rep a hundred times a year. So I knew that rep super well. Plus we start with just a closer walk from at the back of the hall um, and I have a magic explosion that I do and all this stuff. So it's, we're pretty casual at the beginning of our <laughs> concerts. <laughs> and we're also connecting to the audience more than half of our shows memorized and all this stuff. So when I went to do this recital, I was incredibly prepared because there was, I had a lot of good fear. Something else I haven't talked about today too, that uh, fear isn't always bad. There's some good fear. And the good fear gets me off of the couch and into practicing <laughs> and it inspires me. Um, but it's only backstage where it's good fear. On stage, not a place for fear. Another work that we're doing. So I, but I didn't have enough. Um, anyway, what I, what I realized when I walked out on stage as well is that I smiled and bowed and then I sent my energy out to the audience like I did with Canadian Brass. And uh, that recital could have gone a lot better. <laughs> my mouth went super dry and I just all these other, it was so foreign to me, the performance in that situation. And I learned a lot. My next 10, 20 work recitals after that got better and better and better. But one of the things that I realized was when I came out there, and sent the energy out after that experience, I, from then on, I would now come out and smile and say, hello audience, thank you very much for coming or whatever. And then, okay, bye-bye. And just think what you need, whatever. I am, we only have 100% of our mind. If I have 5% on what they're thinking, now I only have 95% to look at the music and to operate, to do my job. <laughs> That's another thing I would say as far as execution and, and being in there and the, the meditative qualities of being present in performance. Woo, it's a long answer. <laughs> it is. I have a question from uh, Inman Red. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for your presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, we. Oui. Okay. Um, if that's okay, I'm going to go back in your memory lane and get that French out. So I'm going to ask the question in French. And obviously, feel free to answer in English. Um, on discute beaucoup de préparation avant un concert, non? Donc, des répétitions ensuite, de présenter nos œuvres à plein de gens à chaque jour pour être prêt au concert, pour avoir une meilleure, un meilleur esprit quand on est sur scène. Donc, tout ça, c'est pour préparer pour le concert et ce sont toutes de très bonnes techniques. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on fait après un concert si le concert a très mal été? Si on se retrouve après le concert complètement détruit et on a mis en place toutes ces techniques-là pour bien réussir, mais que ça a très mal été. How do you pick yourself back up from that? Okay, you have to let me know if I misunderstood. But, um, um, I don't know if this this comes to mind is that when I quit horn and came back to it, I played badly 
but I didn't feel bad about playing badly. Um, and, and that was a gift for me because I had quit horn for three years. So I, I got to do that and then I, it was just something I did. And I, I think I probably wasn't as committed as well. So I had less to lose, but it was something I've, I've really worked on keeping is that you are not who. Um, and there's a poem by Rudyard Kipling called If, and it's, uh, if you can approach both triumph and disaster and treat both these imposters the same. Um, so, and I've changed it to, if you can look at both uh, success and failure. I could freak out right now. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm teaching what's, you know, but my son or anyone. Um, so that, because we all we also know musicians who think too highly of themselves because they're good at their instrument, and it's such a scary. It's just, it's a glass house ready for that, waiting for the moment when they can't play as well as they they need to be to be important or to feel good about themselves. So I just have to get over. I am, and it's so it's getting over the success factor too. That and this is when I. Uh, I keep doing this. I'm making, making fun of myself with the when I couldn't start notes was in Montreal and I was believing that I needed to play perfectly and live up to this young hotshot idea that I thought others were thinking and maybe they were. I don't know. I mean, that, but I had to work on getting over that and making it about the music and, and, and go to the technique so I could figure out the technical aspects and then bring that technique to revering better things than me. You know, that it's, and uh, like the music, the audience, the instrument maker, my teachers, my family, anything, my, the bills I have to pay. No, that's, that's, that's scary. Um, yeah, and I, but I have, Or if I haven't, if I had not done all of this work on getting over myself and getting over the past, and committing to doing the work on the future, making the next one better, I would say I would be way more disappointed. I would be disappointed with 90% of my concerts in my life and drastically, depressingly disappointed if I didn't do this emotional work on go do so, like, but inspire me to do more practice. And now where am I right now? Be with the people I'm with right now or go practice. <laughs> over and over again and I have like I, you hear the list of orchestras that have, I've tricked into hiring me like <laughs> and all the things I've got to I if I was asked I do not think I'm a good I'm I think I'm a good horn player a good musician but my own belief of myself is not us not I don't know it's uh uh, it, it's it, it's potentially very destructive. I hope I'm answering your question. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. I think of it also often as passion and detachment, right? So to be very invested and yeah. yet to be detached of the outcome. So, yeah. Right. And the I think an interesting thing is to be detached of the outcome while you're performing. I can be very attached to the outcome when I'm practicing <laughs> or when I'm on the couch, <laughs> like I have, why am I feeling this? Oh, cause I have a concert tomorrow. Go practice, Nelson, <laughs> go. Then the outcome is okay. And wanting it, I think all the, it's only once I cross the magic line into the performance where I have to be in now, music now, now, now. Yeah, that kind of, so it's yeah, detachment and passionate embrace <laughs> of what I can affect, what I can serve and improve or whatever yeah and and share yeah. another little thing it's not a little thing but another point i can tag on to this too is whenever i'm playing something uh, every time i play it and i think it's in one of the pd the one of the handouts like what was the world's reaction to this piece the first time they heard it it's, you know hearing it just so every time I perform, it is the first time they have heard this piece. Like, and so it doesn't help to know I'm playing this for horn players. Well, you know this part. No, check this out. Really, yes. You know, just that discovery, <laughs> childlike discovery of 
tension and release and storytelling every time. That also, we're doing that in the practice room, even with C major scale. C major scale, one octave descending. The pas de deux from Nutcracker, one of the greatest moments ever. <laughs> or it's not, and it's another Nutcracker coming from the guy who played Chitty Chitty Bang Bang eight times a week for a year and still, and still tried to make it great. Yeah, these choices within that, making everything this new thing. Yeah, yeah, good question. And yeah, yeah, so it, also, the, you know, the Batman thing, why do we fall down to practice picking ourselves back up? So the, the lack of picking ourselves up is lack of thinking that we've fallen you know, that it's, it's either a success or a lesson. Uh, and I have a whole thing about frustration as well, that I think frustration is crazy. And, and basking in frustration, being frustrated. I can have a moment of frustration, but I think uh, we can only be frustrated with something that is over there not being what I want it to be or think it should be, right? Um, that's what I'm frustrated with. Meanwhile, what I'm frustrated with is sitting there being what it actually is, <laughs> right? So a way of letting go or embracing it for what it is. If a friend, a friend of mine shows up 10 minutes late, you know, it's, you can be disappointed, you could be mad if it's the 10th time, but frust frustrated is a lack of learning. Uh, it's like uh, moving to Canada and being frustrated with cold weather. It's crazy. So when we're practicing and, and or someone performs something for me in a lesson and they go, ah, oh, like, that's pretty jarring for me emotionally because you just did it. It came out your instrument. What are you, you're making that, ah. Oh. And I think it's just a mistake that you're, and when I do it too, when I go, ah, oh, it's that I'm making the mistake of thinking I'm better than I just was. <laughs> but I was just this. I mean, look at that, Nelson. You don't have to be emotional. It's reality. So the, the, uh, the cure for frustration is reality and looking at that. And then sometimes that can be hard. That can be some emotional work or go get some ice cream and mourn, mourn our losses. Or yeah, that's the other thing too, is that we don't have to be positive all the time. I've replaced po being positive with being constructive. Sometimes the most constructive thing we can do is go eat ice cream for two days and cry it out, and mourn our loss, bring a friend, warn the friend that that's what they're there for. Uh, and then you come out more ready to do work a couple days later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a lot what you guys are doing. And uh, I'm a binge worker as well. So I go in phases of a lot of work. Like, and that's, that was the thing with the th training in thirds, three thirds of your time. And this works if it's three weeks, even three days essentially. But any time period, having a plan is a really good thing. I had a product productivity guy, a book I read, um, and he said, and I work in a system of dreams, goals, projects, tasks, and this is part of the training in thirds course, but that, that we basically can't do projects. You can only do enough tasks that end up adding together to complete the project. But that's a great way to wake up each day is to have your tasks outlined from planning the night before, and then you just knock those out. Tasks are things you can do in 25 minutes or less. Make sure they're along the line of your projects and goals and dream. And go through, like, for example, for me, dream, making living in music. Um, goal, uh, play your best you possibly can at the Montreal Symphony Audition. Projects is each excerpt on the list. And health and sleep and emotional <laughs> smartness and all that stuff. And then the tasks are first note of trust, go which five, low two, all those tasks per day. And you break it down and really plan it. It's a lot less emotional load, a lot less tiring, more scientific. And it, you can really get a lot more self awareness too along the way. Yeah. Jeff, there's a question uh, in the uh, QA window uh, from Ricardo. Um, if you don't have it right in front of you, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. How can we balance mental health with the phrases, with the phrases, with the phrase, uh, in every audition, there's excuses and a winner, which one are you going to be? Question mark. I think you touched on this, but, uh, different way of phrasing the question, I guess. Right. 
No, yeah, that's a good, good clarity. I think the clarity on how to balance that is that's a timing issue. So the way to hear that saying for me, how to hear it best is that the person who ends up winning figured it out. Uh, and uh, the, the, I recommend a guy, I'll write his name down here, Brendan Burchard. He's a guy that uh, he has a free podcast and um, all those things. Yes, I see how that's a that's a lot of emotional regret to potentially hold if you didn't win that you had excuses. I think the way it's said though, and the spirit of it is, it's to help us get over those excuses, and it helps before the event. Once it's happened, um, what my my idea of winning an audition is is not just good enough to do the job. There's this line of enough, not enough. I love that clarity. Enough, not enough, that simple. Is it good enough? Or is it, sorry, in tune enough, story rich enough, beautiful enough <laughs> to be the one that ends up being hired? So my goal is to make the decision easy for them. Uh, this is a lot, sorry, this is a whole, <laughs> again, a whole module in the course. <laughs> um, but to make the decision easy for them, I have that written on my inspirational sheet. Now that's a result, so I can't control that, but in my training, because they're choosing, right? But in my training, I want to be out of the muck of the decision of them deciding anything. I wanna be so gloriously in tune, in time, beautiful sound, story rich, and covering the spectrum of things they're gonna need in their orchestra um, or band or whatever, to be the one that they go, okay, well, number, 36 we'll hire them and then but if they're busy let's discuss between 17 and 23 and then you know so it's it's at that level of like michael jordan he wasn't trying to be confident or anything he was just putting the ball in the hoop ball in the hoop right uh that's singular goal um and beethoven and williams sisters they're all and for me it was i was trying to be the greatest i could be instead of better than anyone else. I think if we compete also, there's a lot, I'm really sorry. Uh, if we compete, we lower our standards because now we're against other lowly imperfect humans. We're all imperfect, but we're against other humans. Michael Jordan, Beethoven, they were just being the greatest they could be. And I think I was trying to be the greatest I could be. And I went to the audition, shared that, and it ended up making the decision easy for them. Um, and the excuses versus the winners is that the person who ends up making the decision easy for them has used anything that could become an excuse. They've used it more as a guide to drive their work and to, to get their, it ends up being more than everyone else. So again, I see how that could be a destructive, stressful assessment of what you've done if you didn't win because then I must have just had a bunch of excuses. But the best version of me will go, yeah, I could have done better. My two questions from all the auditions that I didn't win was, number one, was it perfect, Jeff? Yes or no? I made it a yes or no question, and it's always no. Uh, so that's the same when I won, too, that it wasn't perfect. But uh, was it perfect, yes or no? Second one, how can you make the decision easy for them next time? And I, I go back to work, maybe a few days of prying it out. but and. So, and this, again, this is in theory. These are all optimal theories. I get frustrated, I get upset, I get depressed. I, I, I play badly, really well, a lot of the time. Um, all these different things in the balance of this journey that takes us to figure out how to execute close to our best for five notes in a row. Notice the sixth note was, uh, had a, a noticeable quality gap and optimal reset without grief about that note or anything like in performance learning all these all these things uh, so I think that I hope that helps with a healthy way of seeing you either one or they were excuses uh, yeah that it's the emotional factor of an excuse that I, on the front of my Chicago Symphony audition book I had a I always have a card with an and a uh, instrument in just my brain just melted i almost made it <laughs> with an inspirational saying on it and it was it's a picture of a guy with his uh on the top of a mountain wearing skis and everything and it's it and a bunch of moguls 
down the mountain and the saying is, obstacles are the things you see when you take your eyes off your goal. Uh, and I think even more destructive is if you see those obstacles and you get emotional about them instead of go around them, under them and all of that. And this is all, you know, all these sayings are also equally discountable in the opposite direction. So you don't have to balance all the sayings. You got to find the sayings that work for you. Um, yeah, is the paralysis by analysis? I disagree. I think it's, we can get paralyzed by over analysis, but I've watched people decide that analysis is a bad thing. Analysis is not bad and I can, I can crazy analyze, but I think an analysis is learning. Um, but then I overanalyzed and I couldn't start notes because I was too overanalyzed in one area. But that's the over analysis part that we, the only way we find it is by crossing that line. <laughs> and I've crossed it a lot. Uh, and I have that worked into my practice where when I fall off notes, I'm trying to play as softly as possible. If I fall off the note, I have now practiced calmly, keeping my air going and move stuff until the note comes back in purely and or whatever it is so i'm pretty and so it's all that training of being less result based and a lot more of building skills based and maturity that i i didn't have when i i still don't have i'm still working on it at 50. <laughs> the level of enough not enough to get that recording and what the panel hears and what your audience hears to be oh that's just mozart oh, wow <laughs> Uh, Jeff, there's a question here from uh, Gabriel in the, in the chat, and, uh, and I'll I'll paraphrase. And Gabriel, if I get this uh, at all wrong, just uh, go right back into the chat. But he's asking, Jeff, how do you um, balance uh, humility with uh, being, you know, a top level performing artist? How how do you make that balance in in your practice? Humility. Is, versus yeah boasting and and or i think we're canadian that's how i stay humble um it's a reverence and uh i think a place of service and serving music and opportunity performance opportunity and and sharing and all of these things that is in who we all are and that's where I think the fearlessness helps versus the confidence. I'm going to show them. I'm going to be confident or believe in what I'm saying. Um, the, um, I believe in the awesomeness of French horn, the storytelling, the people getting to take some time off of their day and focus on something else rather than their troubles. Uh, anything that we're in different, I have a, an arsenal or a repertoire of fear replacements that has me serving things greater than me. And I think that ends up creating humility because it really isn't about me. That's a bonus if I want to get hired, uh, then it is about me because they're hiring me, but more what I'm putting out my bell. Because if I'm, if I'm great because I play great, I'm going to miss a note. And now am I not great? <laughs> am I a bad person? <laughs> and that's what we do to ourselves, right? Oh. Now, we, uh, yeah, so it's balancing, I think, a overall approach of respect and sharing that ends up creating humility. Yeah, I think humility can get in the way. My I remember my mother, she's from Toronto, and she, and she said, stop being so Canadian. <laughs> that, you know, and I would walk, come in, and again, this is a whole other lecture, but I would come in and go, just let me get out of your way, just let me play a few notes, and, you know, and I'd rush myself and play badly. And, oh, take your time. Pete Sullivan, principal trombone in Montreal, and now he's principal in Pittsburgh. He got to Calgary, and they said, okay, hurry up, hurry up. And, it's short. and he said, okay, and I just walked my speed. And then, okay, okay, go ahead, play. And I, he said, I stood there and I said, you guys, this is my time. I'm going to play for my seven minutes. You guys are going to sit there and listen to me. So, and I love that, that story. That's a short version of it. But uh, I write on my inspirational sheet, take your time. And that takes, that's, maybe I can do that in, with humility, but I have to believe in myself and this moment for this music and the work I've done, and maybe my grandchildren or whatever else inspires me to get over myself and serve things greater than myself and end up being humble. Keep reading, keep meditating.
keep, yeah, get stories from other people too, you know, about humility. Yeah, it's an appreciative approach versus an entitled approach also that we get to do this. Yeah. It's a great way of looking at it. Um, any other questions? Um, I'm just looking at the, uh, the, the panelist pane. And just raise your hand if you have any other questions for Jeff. Maybe Pace, um, you'd like to jump in and just uh, close out the proceedings with, uh, with Jeff? Yeah, I just have, Jeff, when can I have a lesson? <laughs> <laughs> you just, just talk to yourself, dude. I'm just repeating what you taught me. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. This, this has been fantastic, Jeff. What a gift. What a gift for everybody. Thanks. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. We've been trying to make this happen for a, a while. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Good, happy and, and, uh, hum, humble and <laughs> humble by being able to be here and, sh and share this and have my teacher here too. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. It's yeah. been great. It's been great. So, yeah, I loved everybody there. Nina, and your family, your yeah. mom. Yeah. We have to quit yeah. meeting like this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that, on that note, um, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, it's been, a, it's, a, it's been uh, inspirational to have you with us. Um, as, as Pace mentioned, hopefully we can, we can do this in person uh, at uh, Orchestre La Francophonie uh, in Montreal next year. It would be great to have you uh, with uh, En Francais. Aussi. En Francais, that's right. You have your... Okay, so if you're if you're uh, now looking from now till um, August 2021 in thirds, right? Oh, awesome. For your Francais. Oui. Um, okay. <laughs> Allez-y. <Okay. laughs> but uh, seriously, thank you very much on behalf of all of the participants I see there in, in the window. Uh, and, uh, and on behalf of uh, Jean-Philippe as well and Pace. Thank you very much, and uh, we do look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, merci beaucoup, mon cousin. Yeah, good luck, everybody. You guys know what to do and how to do it. Be patient and uh, trust tomorrow is another good concept. Just do your practice well. Results might not be there when, you, when you're looking for it right away. But trust if you're doing it well and remembering what your teacher told you, and then you remember, or that you know, and then you find yourself doing something else that's in your way you have a choice you could either go ah you're doing that again or you can go ah yay i caught it and then get optimal and keep treating yourself well yeah you're mainly with yourself coaching yourself you can do it you can do this how much do you want it there's enough work out there for all of you yeah and being able to work as a musician or anything else you decide you want to do music's a great tool to learn how to learn but yeah it's awesome you can do it Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, à bientôt uh, à Montréal. Oui. <laughs> okay. oui. Thank okay. you, Jeff. Bye. Bye-bye.